Hello everyone and welcome to the first content related video for our class English 2 here in spring semester for Solano Community College. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about our novel that we are beginning this week, Toni Morrison's Beloved, as well as the greater context for why we're studying this in general. We're going to walk through a couple of different things today, both some background on what makes this novel so special in terms of where it sits in the history of literature, specifically American literature, but even more broadly English literature and literature in general. And then I'm going to end this video by touching on a few of the important themes that we're going to think about as we start to read this text and as we cover it over the next three weeks. Let's go ahead and get started with the background information first. What we're doing in this first unit, unit one of this semester, is approaching literature from a style that's called genre studies. All right. And genre studies is just one of the ways that we get to think about studying literature. I'll get to some of the other ones in just a moment so that we can kind of compare and contrast. But in general, genre studies are grounded in the belief that understanding similarities and differences between stories of the same structure is important to the study of literature more general. And when I talk about genre studies with literature, in some sense, we're talking about studying a specific form of writing over a given amount of time. Now, this is in contrast to another type of studying literature that can be done, or a couple of different ones, I should say, that approach literary studies from a different direction. One of these might be understood as period studies. For example, somebody might spend their time writing and thinking about literature written in England from around the time of the American Revolution, right? The late 1700s, maybe just before that, maybe just afterward. Um, another point of reference might be my own graduate education. When I was doing my PhD, I concentrated on the period between the 1560s and 1700s in a couple of different countries and, and their literatures, right? So period studies are something where you've narrowed down your literary approach, your scope to a period of time. It might be a short period of time, all texts that were published in 1945, or it might be a longer period, right? Anything before 2000 BC or anything after 1760 um, or 1770s or, or whatever you want to do. Another approach that you can think about, uh, another way to analyze literature would be from an authorship centered approach. In this sense, you might study Shakespeare for your whole life. I know of individuals that are writing about Jane Austen for 20 years on end and, and always studying the same thing. These are different aspects that you can use. There's also cultural studies if you wanted to talk about it like that, right? We could only study American literature. We might study African diaspora literature that would be stories, novels, poems written by people who originally were from a country in Africa, but then were either displaced or moved to a different part of the world and are carrying some of that culture and that literary custom with them. Um, you might, if you're a cultural studies person, study Slavic literature or Russian literature or Japanese literature from all sorts of different genres, novels, poems, plays, all sorts of different periods, right? Anything like that. If we're being honest, today's literary scholars often are doing a combination of a lot of these different approaches. A specialist in English novels from 1700 to 1900, for example, would combine aspects of genre, period, and cultural studies in trying to better understand sort of what novels did for England during this specific period in time. The most common way, though, if we go back to our idea of genre studies, to break down the genres of literature, the different structures, the different forms of literature um, into their most basic roots would be talking about them in terms of whether they're pieces of poetry, pieces of prose or, or written out language, uh, paragraphs, longer sentences, things like that or pieces of drama, right? Performances. Even here though, the idea of doing genre studies gets a little bit tricky because each of these categories can be very broad in and of itself. For example, if we're talking about poetry, you might ask the next question of what kind of poetry, right? If we're talking about genre studies, there are actually many different kinds of poetry of that specific genre itself. The Iliad might be one form that's epic poetry, but we also have things like 
lyric poetry that come out of the 1800s, like the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Here's a poem from Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Shakespeare's sonnets are a totally different kind of poetry. And so if you really wanted to trace all of this out and you say, I study poetry, I'm a genre study specialist who specializes in poetry, you actually most often have to be a little bit more specific, right? Is it epic? Is it a ballad? Do you study nursery rhymes or sonnets? Every period, every culture, every type of literature often develops its own sense of poetry too. And so talking about just studying poetry is actually quite broad in and of itself. We can do a similar exercise if we want to think about studying prose. Some people don't want to study poetry. Some people aren't interested in shorter um, metrical lines and things like that. And we just want to read stories written out in full form, full sentences, paragraphs, things like that. And so we turn to prose literature. Once again, though, that category, prose, is just a little bit too broad to give us anything to work with. We know that we don't want to do poetry and we know that we won't want to do drama, but what's in between that, right? There's sort of a wide range that you can choose from. You can think about prose as being history itself, as being fables and short stories that are meant to give a lesson. Prose can be what's used for myths and ancient texts that talk about how gods or the world came into being, right? Much of the Old Testament and the New Testament are written out into prose, even as things like the Psalms are written in meter and are more poetic. You, of course, have just letters in general, but also novels, romances, and even modern stuff like blogs or editorials are all written in prose. And this list that I have here is, of course, not exhaustive. Um, your emails that you write to me are in prose. A lot of what Canvas is put in is prose, right? I don't put any meter or any poetry in to try and explain to you when assignments are. And so prose itself is a broad category that needs further definition if we're going to talk about being a genre study specialist, if we're diving into the idea of studying something specific to do with prose writing. What we're going to do for this class is think about genre studies in terms of an example of a very, very specific and very special type of prose, and that is the novel. Now, just to zoom even further back and to think about the novel and its origins, the novel is a form of fictional prose that became popular in Western Europe and England throughout the 1700s. The earliest form of something that we call a novel today was published in 1605 by an author named Miguel Cervantes. This is the novel Don Quixote, which you may or may not have heard of, but novels themselves became even more popular as the 1600s went on. And from the 1700s till about the 1900s, the novel was one of the major forms of writing in Europe and England itself. Novels are always long form stories that are meant to be digested over a period of days or even weeks. This is of course in opposition to something like poetry that is going to be short and something that you think about maybe for days on end, but that you only take five or six seconds to read. More importantly, novels often concentrate on one character and follow that character through a series of challenging events that highlight a sense of growth or change in that individual. As as I'm sure you understand, novels themselves have a lot of different subcategories. This genre could be divided up into a lot of different subcategories for novels themselves, from proto-novels like Don Quixote to things called the picaresque, epistolary novels, salon novels, the English novel, the gothic novel, romantic novels, and of course, something that we're going to talk a lot about in this class, the American novel. I want to pause here because I think it's very important to understand just how powerful the history of the novel is in terms of its many, many different subcategories or, or evolutions or the way that it changed over time. If the first novel was created in 1605, by the time we've hit the 1750s, just 150 years later, there are so many novels being published throughout Europe and England especially that you couldn't possibly hope to read all of them in a lifetime. And that's just if you stopped the line at 1750. Since then, especially in America, the idea of the novel has remained 
incredibly central to the idea of what writing and what literature is. Most of the modern works that we read, most of the contemporary books or, or stories or what have you that we read today can be thought of in some ways as novels. This is such the case that some people have argued that every Western culture, England especially, but France, Spain, Germany, and of course America, developed a lot of their sense of identity through the writing of novels. People like Jane Austen, people like Mary Shelley, for example, who wrote Pride and Prejudice and then Frankenstein, Bram Stoker's Dracula, all of these texts helped form what is thought of now as the English identity throughout the 17, 18, and 1900s. And so while it's one thing just to think about the idea that, hey, here's this very popular form of writing that people seem to like to read, you know, instead of only thinking about this as akin to the way that we watch Netflix and how every show is probably somewhere around an hour episodes and there's maybe 10 to 20 episodes in a season, right? How all of that looks the same. Instead of just thinking about the novel as something like that, where people's wants and desires have molded it into being what it is, we can also think about how it's affected the idea of being a part of these nations. And this is a very specific and very special kind of relationship that a genre has with the idea of the nation or a country or a society itself. Not all forms of literature, sonnets or poems or epics or things like that, necessarily connect with identity to such a strong degree. The novel is special in terms of history and, a, and as a historical genre, and this is part of the reason that we're looking at it in terms of our text for this unit. Those of you who are familiar with writing at least a little bit from the last couple of hundreds of years will recognize that many of our most famous, many of our most applauded writers from that time period have been novelists rather than poets or, or dramatists or anything like that. You might recognize names on this list like Leo Tolstoy or Charles Dickens, Mark Twain or Herman Melville. What the importance of the novel brings about in terms of American literature is something very, very interesting. Interesting. And that is this idea of a great American novel. And it goes something like this. I already told you that every nation, every, every population, every culture, maybe throughout the 1700s, the 1800s, and into the 1900s started leaning into the novel as one of the ways that you can build an identity. Well, there's an idea that comes out of the 1860s that America needed its own literature, that it needed to have its own identity that was represented by authors from the nation born on the continent that wrote in an American way in some sense or another. And the issue with this, or, or at least the challenge, is that up until this point, up until the 1860s or so, it's arguable that America, the United States, doesn't have its own kind of literature. You have to remember, the United States only became the United States at the end of the 1700s. And so most literature before the 1850s and 1860s wasn't thought of as as American. It might have been thought of as colonial, but it's often tied back to the point of origin of whoever is writing it. And so if you're writing in English, you might be considered an English person writing in America. If you're writing in French, because there's plenty of French people, um, especially in the Louisiana region and in parts of Canada that sort of touch onto American soil, that would have been considered French literature. And so if you're writing during the 1760s, the 1770s, the 1780s, there isn't really an aspect of your writing that's necessary necessarily considered American. By the time that the 1860s come around, we have a slight change in this idea. There's a push as America becomes solidified, as the nation becomes a little bit more stable, as it starts to mature, as more explorers push west and start to colonize more and more territory. There's a push for the Americanization of the arts, or at least a way to show the world that we are cultured enough to have our own paintings, our own music, our own literature, our own writing, our own identity in the artistic world. And so we get 
American art, American paintings, American imaginings of what painting should be for the first time during the 1800s. And a similar thing starts to happen with the composition of music and, of course, with literature and writing itself. In 1868, then, there is this scholar who puts forward this idea that what we're awaiting, what America really needs, and you have to remember this is just post-Civil War, and so we're going into the Reconstruction, we're going into a time when we really need to heal as a nation. And so this scholar of literature argues that what America really needs is a great American novel. And he starts to point out that there's been great writers and great English novels or great French novels, right, or works of art or poetry. There have been stable, foundational, artistic pieces that prove the identity of these other nations and that America needed one so that it could solidify its own sense of self. This person, John William de Forest, evaluated at that time when he wrote this article a couple of the novels that had appeared either during or just before his own time, including things like Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, The Last of the Mohicans, Moby Dick, and a couple of others. De Forest found none of these to fit the actual category of what he was calling the great American novel. And in fact, the idea itself, as it picked up momentum among scholars, has always been kind of problematic. You might be already able to see some of the issues that just arise when you say great American novel, especially as we look at this slide, when you think about the things that the novel is supposed to cover. The great American novel, for example, is supposed to encompass the entire nation's peoples. It's supposed to be democratic in spirit, and it's supposed to touch on very American traditions and themes. And the issues with that are, of course, what does it mean to be American or to have democratic spirit or to even touch on American traditions or themes? On top of that, there's always a conversation of race here. Most of what DeForest was thinking about when he said great American novel were novels written about white people's conquest of the West or the middle of the country. It was sort of taken for granted in the 1860s that the great American novel wouldn't be written by someone of Asian descent or someone of African descent or anybody of minority or lower classes or different social values. And so the idea itself, while interesting, is immediately struck with a lot of different controversial aspects. And because of this, the great American novel is still a subjective and slightly controversial topic, even if it's a little bit outdated, even if nowadays we don't really think about there even being the opportunity for someone to write the great American novel, right? There are just good pieces of literature, good novels that we should all read that maybe have American themes. Despite this, however, despite the problems that are inherent to the idea of the great American novel, there's been a lot of successful, important, and powerful American literature that has come out of this idea. There are a lot of authors that read this idea or had somebody talk about it who then went on to write some of their most famous or most powerful works with the idea of targeting the great American novel. Other people didn't even think about it, but someone else looked at their novel and said, could this be an example? of the great American novel. And these examples that I have up here, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, The Great Gatsby, The Grapes of Wrath, ideas like this, all cover very important moments in American history. And you can see once you think about what these texts are doing and what they're talking about and the themes and the ways that they want you to think about these stories really does connect to some very American issues, right? If you think about The Jungle, for example, this is a novel from 1900s. It's a novel about the horrible working conditions of people in Chicago's meatpacking industry. If you think about the industrialization of America throughout the 1800s and the way that workers' rights evolved, um, things like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, things like events about around unions and, and whatnot, the jungle really does speak to a moment of American history. Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath talks about a similar issue in terms of the Great Depression. 
Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian is about the end of there actually being a West for us to explore. This wanderlust, this idea that Texas is no longer this place where you can just drive cattle across the open land, where there's fences and, and industry and modern road systems that break up your ability to just be a cowboy. Um, and of course, Brett Easton Ellis's American Psycho teaches us that America has a very specific issue with serial killers. Our novel for this unit is Toni Morrison Beloved, a novel that comes from the late 1980s. And Morrison makes no claims when she writes this novel about trying to go after the American novel title um, or trying to write the great American novel in any form. However, the intense Americanness of her novel, Beloved, is really undeniable. It's a story that only happens in America. And while there are other cultures, other nations, other peoples where a similar kind of sets of events might be able to take place, the tone, the structure, and the events of this novel are so very American that they really tap into some of the psyche and some of the issues and some of the ideas and the thoughts and the foundations of what it means to be American to the core. More than this, the issues, the Americanness that Beloved brings up are some of the issues that are often forgotten about or covered up or ignored in American history. Sitha, the novel's protagonist, lives in a home in Cincinnati after having escaped slavery in the South as a younger woman. The weird part is that her home, and I think it's only referenced by the number 124 in Cincinnati, her home is haunted by a ghost. And as we're going to learn, and as you step deeper into the novel, what you're going to see is that this ghost isn't just a disconnected spirit of somebody that used to live in the house that Sitha now has to deal with, but someone that's deeply connected to her life, someone that's deeply connected to her own psychological traumas. And through her, the traumas that the nation has come through, tried to ignore, and is trying at this point in history to reconceive of, to, to get a better handle on in terms of its history and its past and its action. See, this story puts on full display the surreal and supernatural reality of living with this type of trauma, of understanding what has happened to you in some sense or another, and yet not being able to put the pieces of your soul back together after something incredibly terrible and violating and victimizing has happened to you. Interestingly enough, Morrison was inspired to write Beloved by a story that she read somewhere about an escaped slave woman named Margaret Garner who was recaptured by the U.S. Marshals in 1850. Now, at the time, if you escaped from the South and you got to the North, there was a law that said that U.S. Marshals had to bring you back. There were property rights involved. Um, and it meant that there was a lot of hunting in the North for escaped slaves. Garner was captured by U.S. Marshals in the North, and when she was captured, she was attempting to end the lives of her three young children, having already killed her oldest before the U.S. Marshals could get there. Toni Morrison's novel takes this story, and it reimagines the relationships between a character like Margaret, in the form of Sita, and her daughters, specifically one that's still alive, and one that she either killed or ended up not being able to protect earlier in her life, and it actually brings the murdered child back to life in the form of a young woman named Beloved. This is our ghost from the beginning, and of course, she's going to morph into an actual corporeal, physical person um, as the novel goes on. The power of telling a story like this is that we get a clash between the type of sympathetic response, the sorrow, the feeling, the emotion that we have for someone in Sita's position, someone who's been victimized, enslaved, and treated horribly her whole life, and the idea that she may or may not have killed one of her children in order to get herself out of a bad situation or to protect the others. And so she's pushed to the edge of human experience, forced to make decisions that none of us would want to make, and we have to try and deal with the complex issue of having known that she murdered one of her children, and also knowing that she may not be responsible for all of the things that happens around her or that she does because of the trauma of her past. And so as you read for this weekend, and as you read for the next couple of weeks, and as you go towards the paper that's going to be due in week five, try to think about what adding that supernatural element of having the ghost of a murdered child come back does for the idea of a novel. If this is a story about Sitha and her changes, about the shifts in a family that's going through processing trauma, how does this novel put those feelings, those emotions, and those challenges on display? And how does it make us think about the American identity as we 
think about the way that Sita is allowed to change or is forced to change based on her circumstances. That's all I have for now. Please remember that you have a discussion post on the supernatural elements of Beloved and on the first 100 pages due this Sunday. And otherwise, we'll keep working on this novel and keep working towards that first essay as the weeks go on. Thank you very much. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns, and I will talk to you all soon.